This is the Moral Science Podcast, and I'm your host, Amber Cazell. In this series, I get to interview experts in my favorite subject, the scientific study of human morality, virtues and vices, evolution of morals, the judgment action gap, character development, the philosophy of morality, transcendent experiences, researchers' moral biases, cultural values, plus the obligatory trolley dilemma. We are going to talk about it all. Robert Wright is a journalist and the best-selling author of Three Scientists and Their Gods, Looking for Meaning in an Age of Information, The Moral Animal, Non-Zero, The Logic of Human Destiny, The Evolution of God, and Why Buddhism is True. He is edited for Time and Slate and has written for The New Yorker, The Huffington Post, and New York Times Magazine, among others. He is a visiting professor of science and religion at Union Theological Seminary and the founder of the Non-Zero Foundation, as well as a director of Blogging Heads TV and Meaning of Life TV, where you can watch him discuss the big questions with other intellectuals. In this podcast, Bob talks about the trajectory of his interests, as well as the relationships between evolution, morality, and consciousness. I had a column called The Information Age. A publisher, an editor at a New York publishing house, uh, wrote me a letter, and we had lunch. And that he wound up being my my editor uh, for three scientists and their gods. I was interested. Uh, so that book is a lot about different aspects of the information, information technology, and information science. And I had just gotten deeply interested in that. The digital revolution was just starting to happen um the you know i wrote that book on the first computer i ever owned a, a k pro 2 and uh, well, actually the first the first computer that like came with a monitor and a keyboard i had had a commodore 64 but I, we won't get into that the um uh and so i was really getting interested in the various issues raising you know ranging from information actual information theory to uh, the social implications of information technology and even the possibility that um, maybe the, 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 the basic fabric of the universe was digital. The first, that book, that book consisted of three profiles punctuated by essays. And the first profile was about a guy named Ed Fredkin who was at MIT and had a theory of so-called digital physics uh, according to which the universe was in some sense a computer. And, and that has had other people of uh, Stephen Wolfram, who has since, I, I think, maybe written a whole book about that. that, that that's kind of um, shown up periodically, that idea. Anyway, I was interested in the information age um, and information science. That was the unifying theme. Although one of the three, I mean, the two other people I profiled got, uh, while allowing me to sustain the theme of information in, in some sense or another, also connected to other issues that I'm interested in and have gotten interested in and have been interested in since. One was a profile of E.O. Wilson, of course, coined the term sociobiology, uh, which we now, we now call what he would call human sociobiology, evolutionary psychology. Uh, the third guy was an, uh, a Quaker economist named Kenneth Boulding who allowed me to get into a lot of issues of kind of the direction of human history, how technological evolution had shaped that, and what kinds of philosophical questions that raised, including questions of uh, purpose, inc including the possibility that maybe there's the unfolding of a purpose through human history. So there were a lot of dimensions to that book. In a certain sense, um, I haven't raised any fundamentally new issues since then. I mean, uh, my my books, my my, I think all of my subsequent books, in a certain sense, pick up on one or another of the issues that that were in that book. Yeah, that's fascinating. I can definitely hear the foundations of your other books in in what you've just said. Um, so, the next one that you write is the moral animal, and this one. So for, for those who are listening who aren't familiar with The Moral Animal, this is a book that essentially talks about the evolution of different morality, just the moralities that we have in a lot of different spheres of life. So there's a section on sexual morality, a section on familial morality, and it 
it's just a fascinating book. And then it's also delightful because it incorporates um, Darwin's own life stories and, and examples of these moralities playing out in Darwin's life, which is fun. Um, and I, I think that that's fascinating. I think the endeavor in the first place of trying to understand and root morality from an evolutionary framework has clearly been extraordinarily influential in a number in a number of big thinkers today. So you you came from a religious background, you said, and you started to question that as a teenager and kind of moved from that. Would you consider yourself now to be a naturalist or a physicalist in your thinking about these issues? Um I think I'm a naturalist. Uh yes, very much. Um the uh I you know I remain a, a you know, pretty hardcore Darwinian, a naturalist. Uh, the only reason I, I, I might um, hesitate to call myself a physicist or materialist is because I, uh, when it comes to consciousness, I guess I'm what is called a mysterian. I, I, I think it's a profoundly mystifying question, uh, why we have subjective experience uh, and so on. Um, and what the relationship is of that experience to uh, what we think of as the physical world, um, I, 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 I'm certainly not. I'm certainly not an eliminated. What is it? Eliminative physicalist or materialist in the sense you know the people who 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 are kind of arguing that consciousness doesn't exist in a certain sense. I think it's 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 something that deserves its own word and is is mysterious but but so so uh but um the other the other reason i'm not totally i guess a physicalist is i i had a conversation with a princeton philosopher gideon rosen about this not long ago that, that you can get on youtube among other places but well why don't i go ahead and plug my podcast on the right show too um the but uh and you know there's also the fact that as we as physicists have dug down to deeper and deeper levels it's less and less clear that what's at the bottom is something that we would that corresponds very closely with what we intuitively, you know, mean when we think of the physical. So there's that too. But anyway, I'm a Darwinian. I I don't, in terms of explaining human behavior, I don't. Uh, I I do not bring in any. Uh, I I stick with a strictly scientific framework, uh, and um. And, and yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because over the past, you know, 30 or so years in in moral psychology really kind of blossoming, I, I had, I, I've been really fortunate to speak with a number of really cool scholars. And one of the conversations I really enjoyed was with um, the anthropologist Richard Schwader. And he has sort of these, this theory of ethical pluralism, and it influenced his his later student, Jonathan Haidt, to go on and um, kind of structure and create moral foundations theory as we currently know it. Um, are, I'm assuming you're familiar with moral foundations theory, but perhaps- it's Roughly, a yeah. I know John a little. And um, I mean, I well, you to make sure I'm on the right wavelength. So he, I mean, the most common application of it you read about is in kind of uh, shedding some light on ideological disposition, right? Like- like we have these like these dimensions that are very important, like how much emphasis we put on things like purity uh, and fairness and authority. If you I, I guess he's he's of the view that if you look at how people stand, where people sit on these various uh, dimensions, that's going to help predict their ideology. That That's the application I'm familiar with. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's totally correct that. um he, this, this idea that we have different sort of moral taste buds, sometimes they're called, and that different people emphasize different ones, and that can cause ideological conflicts in the political realm and in other areas, but politics is kind of an easy one to point to and, and see that at work. And but but anyway, I've gotten a little bit off track. The point I was trying to make is that it was it was kind of Jonathan Haidt that first started to really try to ground this idea of of intuitionism as a product of 
this deep evolutionary history that has sort of given us these moral tendencies that we have now. And so he really, in psychology, represented somebody who grounded morality in an evolutionary framework of sorts. And mm -hmm. there's sort of mixed opinions about this because, you know, a lot of people will say, okay, well, just because it evolved doesn't mean it's moral. And even in the moral animal, you go into lots of examples of, you know, people operating by these, by these seeming moral algorithms of sorts that people or animals will cheat at sort of these predictable situations and crossroads. And there's a sort of a balancing point between how many people are faithful in their sexual relationships, if they're monogamous, and how many people are not, and, and things like this that are, that are quite provocative. Um, and so when it comes to grounding things in an evolutionary framework, it's interesting to me to think about morality as a product of evolution. And I'm not sure that that is necessarily where you're coming from, but I'm wondering about that because it seems like evolution has produced both behaviors we consider moral and behaviors we consider immoral. Um, yeah, yes, it certainly can. I certainly do think that morality is productively understood. I, I uh, uh, well, morality, what I mean, I mean, you know, the whole moral, you know, realm of the moral consideration of things is, is kind of, and behaviors is best understood as uh, a either, well, product or byproduct of evolution. I mean, I think, you know, the, the, I would just say Darwinism is one of the main illuminating factors in understanding it. Not, not the only thing you need to think about. Uh, I, I think John and I agree on that. Um, John Haidt. I mean, I, I, I don't know enough about moral foundations theory to know if I buy into that. I'm aware of a couple of recent papers that have kind of raised um, questions about its empirical foundation. Uh, and I don't know. I, I don't know how penetrating they are or aren't. But but the, the broader question of, um, you know, absolutely, I, I think our moral in, our fundamental moral intuitions, by which I mean ones that you find, so far as I know, in every culture, um, are, are products of natural selection in some sense. And, uh, you know, even some, even some intuitions that may vary from culture to culture can be well understood with the help of uh, a Darwinian framework. But I mean, if you, if you just take something like the intuition that, well, and just to stop and, and, and uh, first and, 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 and yeah, put a, a punctuation after the point you made, yeah, it's it's certainly not the case that whatever is natural is good. It's it's not the case that um, that because a, a, a moral intuition is an evolved one, it it should be respected. If anything, I might think the opposite. I I mean, you know, because a lot of times the alternative hypothesis is that a moral intuition has been. Uh, implanted by uh, a, a, an all-knowing and benevolent God. Well, uh, if instead, as I believe, um, our moral intuitions are products of natural selection, then what they've been implanted by is this uh, really kind of strange process <laughs> that values genetic proliferation above everything else and certainly, we know, gives rise to lots of behaviors that we don't morally approve of, um, and it gives rise to a number of human inclinations that uh, I think we have a right to be skeptical of, like uh, aggression under, you know, violence under certain circumstances. Um, and, and so I, I think, you, you know, the, uh, to, to take seriously the idea that our moral intuitions are products of natural selection is, is to take seriously the idea that uh, we need to subject them to really uh, harsh scrutiny top to bottom and ask if they're defensible. Um, the, the, I, I mean, the one that I feel sure is an evolved intuition is the, the intuition that good deeds should be rewarded and bad deeds should be punished. When I say I feel sure, I mean 99.99. .99. I mean, I don't think science ever tells us anything for sure, but... Uh, uh, with with a high percentage of confidence, um, I think that's an intuition uh, that that 
was given to us by natural selection and i and i think um deserves to be appraised with skepticism that isn't to say we wind up rejecting her that uh, that it's not useful but um i don't think it's it's truth should be taken for granted yeah yeah i and i and i think i i would have assumed that you were um physicalist uh, uh, like we talked about earlier in some way and i that sort of helps me understand where you're coming from a little bit better because it it seems like well if if morality isn't purely um like we we can evolve these moral intuitions but if we can also judge them and say that they are not necessarily good intuitions to have then that implies that morality is rooted at a deeper level in something beyond just natural selection um and i wonder is that you would mention that consciousness is you're not really sure what to make of consciousness in light of evolution do you think that those two are potentially related i, I guess i'm just trying to understand how you're wait thinking. That, that the question of consciousness is related to to um the ability to say that we can evaluate we can morally evaluate evolved moral intuitions does mm -hmm. that make sense where i'm coming from i don't know if i'm being very well, clear in i would say um for my money the existence of consciousness which is just to say the existence of subjective experience the fact that it is like something to be alive yeah like qualia the experience of qualia or yeah yeah just, just you know thomas nagel's phraseology is you know what it is to, to believe something is consciousness is to believe that it is like something to be that thing well we all can say or speaking for myself i can say for sure it's like something to be me i assume it's like something to be everybody else and like something to be uh uh a lot of animals and and possibly other things but the um to me that fact the fact of subjective experience is what gives uh morality um moral questions actual meaning and it gives life meaning i mean if you imagine uh, you know, a, a bunch of, and I did this thought experiment in my book, Three Scientists and Their Gods. I, I got into this, uh, you know, this is in, in whatever, in the late 80s, I got into this uh, whole question of, um, you know, imagine there could in principle be beings just like us who do what we do, even speak. Because remember, although we think of ourselves as consciously processing language, you could, in theory, build a robot that would just sense my physical, the physical sound waves emanating from my mouth, respond appropriately without being conscious. That's possible in principle. So I'm like, suppose there is a planet full of such beings. Um, in other words, suppose that consciousness is, a, is an epiphenomenon um, and, you, and suppose you could create beings that lacked it but still functioned as they do. Would it matter whether you destroyed that planet, would it matter whether uh, those the, the creatures on that planet killed one another? I think most of us would say not, because if there was no subjective experience on the planet, um, like, what does it matter? You know, I mean, um, and, and I think most of us, whether we think about it or not, certainly utilitarian, certainly a lot of, you know, kind of consequentialists. And, and I think most most other uh, kinds of moral thinkers um do actually associate the, the very significance of moral questions with the fact that it's like something to be alive. So there's that relevance of consciousness to moral considerations generally. And I would say, I would add that, um, well, let's see how tangential I want to um, seem to get here. But, but I mean, I would say, look, it, it, it's the fact that moral intuitions are a product of natural selection doesn't totally preclude the possibility of their emanating uh, from some d divine being in the sense that you could have a deistic view and say, well, it's, a, it's a, some God set natural selection in motion or set the universe in motion and gave it physical properties that made natural selection likely to arise. And, um, you know, you, you, could, you could say that. And if you wanted to ask, well, is there any any reason to actually believe that the universe was created um, by such a being, you might actually point to the fact of consciousness because it, it, it's 
the fact that it is in the universe, um, to my mind, makes the universe a meaningful place. And and the fact that there's no obvious reason for it to, to exist, uh, I think, from a scientific point of view. I personally think that people that in general theories about, oh, here's why consciousness exists, because it does this, because it does that, blah, blah, blah. I think in general those are just, those are confused. By my lights, I could be wrong, but, um, but uh, I think in general people who, who say, yeah, I've got it, here's why consciousness exists, as a rule, I think don't understand the profundity of the mind-body problem. And um, the, so, uh, I think it's, we have to consider it pretty amazing that the universe is like that. I think it ranks right up there with the fact that something exists as an amazing thing. It's amazing that anything exists. And then it's amazing that there are these, there's the possibility of sensing existence, existence subjectively. In other words, it's amazing that subject, subjective experience exists. So um, if you wanted to posit that there is notwithstanding how kind of in some ways, um, you know, draining of meaning Darwinism can seem, if you wanted to hope for there still being uh, something um, maybe purposeful at the very bottom of the universe, at the very foundation, or something divine, or something whatever, I think the existence of consciousness is one thing you would you would cite. Yeah, the, the existence of I mean, I, I, showing my cards here, I totally agree. I think the existence of consciousness is certainly not accounted for yet. And as a psychologist, I see this bleed out into, into even these small things, um, like saying, oh, well, disgust, like we have disgust because it helps us accomplish X or Y or Z evolutionary task better or something, Mm -hmm. but it's Mm -hmm. not, it's still it feels like kind of what you said. It feels like it's right. missing the mind's body. Kind of, it, like it's missing the problem of quality in the first place. Like right. well, we can we can make a computer do something efficiently. That doesn't mean it's experiencing it. And if it did, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to help the computer do that task any better. No, I agree. I mean, I, the, the example I usually use is just, you know, when you when your hand gets too close to a fire, you feel pain and you withdraw your hand. It's fine to speak as a kind of shorthand about pain being what caused you to withdraw, but the fact is, if you're a real behavioral scientist of a mainstream sort, you believe, I think you should believe, that in principle there is a strictly material account of what happened, beginning with the the effect that fire has on sensors at, the, at your fingertips, right? Physical sensors sends physical stuff and send physical signals up your arm that eventually leads you to withdraw your hand. Y- you can account for that in strictly physical terms. And, and so too, whenever we use a word like, I did that because I was afraid, I did that because... Whenever we talk about subjective experience in a causal way, you know, I think if you really are a scientific materialist, you should think of that as a kind of convenient shorthand and 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 think that in principle you could construct a strictly physical account of why the behavior happened and if that's true then it's pretty mysterious why subjective experience exists because apparently it has no actual role in the causal chain now now that's one view of consciousness that's an epiphenomenalist view of consciousness but i've got to say that's the all all the alternatives to that are even weirder, you know. They they, they I mean, the epiphenomenalist view. Unless you flat out say consciousness doesn't exist, then of all the views of consciousness, I think the epiphenomenalist is the one that is kind of clearest, the simplest to understand, in a certain sense, most consistent with a scientific view of things. And yet, it is it it, it, it it's within a scientific. Uh, worldview that it raises the most profound questions, if I'm putting that right. I mean, it, 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 it just, if you are a scientific materialist and, and believe that consciousness exists, assuming that's not a contradiction of, of terms in itself, um, you've got to ask, you've got to appreciate deeply the weirdness of the existence of consciousness and be completely baffled by it, I think. Yeah, yeah. So as somebody who's written a book about the evolution of morality, who simultaneously 
believes that morality is somewhat irrelevant without consciousness. Um, was it sort of that tension that led to your other books or, or do you continue to wrestle with that or do you feel comfortable with that? Comfortable with that? You mean the tension between what and what and what? Well, the tension between having provided this beautiful yeah. account of morality yeah. in purely evolutionary terms combined with the fact that it doesn't seem like evolution provides a satisfactory account of consciousness for you and that and that consciousness seems to be necessary for morality. Yeah, that's an interesting, I've never put it in quite such challenging fashion myself. I mean, I do think evolution provides a satisfactory account of human behavior, which doesn't mean it's all in the genes, but in principle, all behavior uh, must be a product of, in some sense, genes interacting with environment, according to, you know, and according to rules in the genes. And, um, and so I do think, it, just to be clear, that, that in principle, uh, evolution accounts for behavior. Um, the, I guess, uh, what would I say? I guess I'd say, if we imagine a planet in which uh, consciousness doesn't exist, then the books I wrote, and books could still exist, again, because, you know, when you can read a book and just the physical things, you know, bounce, photons bounce off the page, enter your eyes, and, you know, you can, you could make book reading robots. I'm sure, I'm sure uh, near, somewhere near where you live, that's happening. Um, the, uh, um, in that world, my book might be different because I wouldn't dwell on the moral stuff so much because it just wouldn't matter so much. I mean, you would still, in other words, so evolution would, you know, would still account for why um, people favor kin, you know, why they're more likely to feel guilty about neglecting kin than they are to feel guilty about neglecting some randomly selected human. It's just that, that I wouldn't consider that fact a pressing moral uh, factor. I, w I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't, you know, dwell on the injustice of, of that or the lack of kind of moral optimality of that in some sense. Um, and, of course, this gets into the fact that, uh, I don't know how weird we want to get, but, of course, once you, once you have language, I mean, even if you have an epiphenomenal account of consciousness, in other words, it, it, it's like its relationship to the physical stuff is like, to the physical organ of the brain is like a shadow is uh, has the relationship of my shadow to my hand when my hand moves and its shadow moves. Um, even if that's true, once you have self-reflection and language, then consciousness does start to influence things because like you talk about it, we're talking about it. This conversation would not happen if consciousness didn't exist. So right. I just, I just thought I'd throw that into further. Yeah, you know. there's like all these meta levels. Yeah. Well, let's, I want to shift gears so we have some time to talk about um, non-zero and why Buddhism is true as well. So from the moral animal, why did you then write non-zero? Was that still kind of percolating from having written um, the three scientists and their gods and you wanted to return to that idea? Or was there something else that kind of sparked that after the moral animal? Well, non-zero is kind of a fleshing out of the third part of Three Scientists and Their Gods. The moral animal was a fleshing out of the second part. So I had gotten into this question of how human history seemed to have a direction, at least in the sense of, um, you know, reaching higher and higher levels of organization, you know, hunter-gatherer village, chiefdom, not to oversimplify the structure, there is local variation, but the fact is we have gotten from uh, a world in which the most complex social organization is a hunter-gatherer village to a globalized world. And that seems to be not just a fluke or an accident, but the result of a, a kind of a basic direction that is impelled largely by technological evolution as it um, interacts with human nature and, of course, is produced by human nature. I mean, humans... Humans produce technology, and then their social organization is shaped by it. But um, so I wanted to look at how that happens. Um, I developed a way of talking about it in terms of game theory. 
which uh, was basically that, um, you know, new technologies come along and they either facilitate the playing of non-zero-sum games with more and more people at greater distances uh, or they encourage it. So, I mean, like, uh, uh, you know, information technologies can facilitate the playing of non-zero-sum games at greater distances. Roman roads were, in that sense, information technologies. Um, armaments can encourage the playing of non-zero-sum games of richer, more elaborate ones in the sense of encouraging, like, individual nations to um, cooperate internally uh, more elaborately in order to be able to fight the war. So, um, it, basically, the argument was uh, new technologies uh, intensify the logic. Well, they lead to bigger non-zero-sum games over greater distances involving more and more people. And I, you know, I'd also been interested in the growth of uh, biological complexity through natural selection. And so I argued that you could actually use the same basic uh, framework to, to look at that, to, to see the growth from, you know, individual cell to, well, or from prokaryotic to eukaryotic to multi-celled animal to society of multi-celled animal. You could... You could view this as, in some sense, a growth of non-zero-sumness that had certain um, parallels to the cultural version I just described. And, uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was going to... Did we talk about what non-zero means, just in case somebody uh, is not familiar with game theory? Um, yeah, I was wondering about that. I mean, I know you have a somewhat academic audience. And these days, I mean, I, I think the terminology is more familiar than it was when I wrote the book, uh, which is 19 years, 20 years ago. Um, but uh, yeah, it's basically just a game in which, uh, to simplify it, there can be a win-win or lose come out, uh, lose-lose outcome. In other words, the sums of the fortunes of the players don't necessarily add up to zero. So in tennis, if you're playing singles, you're playing a zero-sum game with the person on the other side of the net. If you're playing doubles, you're playing a highly non-zero-sum game with your partner because every point is going to be either good for both of you or bad for both of you. Um, and and so, yeah, I mean, non-zero-sum logic is the logic behind cooperation and... Um, and even when it's not conscious cooperation. So our genes cooperate. That's presumably not a result of re conscious reflection on their part, right? It's because natural selection selects genes that cooperate um, and that act as if they understood the logic of cooperation. So anyway, non-zero applied uh, that logic uh, to both biological and cultural evolution as a, as a way of explaining um, how, and I got to say, if you, t if you, if you describe it in terms other than game theory, you can do that. And, and, and uh, other people had kind of done it. So in that sense, there wasn't anything radically new about the book, except using the language of game theory in a, a pretty ambitious fashion to look at this particular question. And then that the book, this led, the, you know, by the end of the book, I was basically looking at two things. Where do we have to go? Where do we go from here in a political and social sense? And my argument was we need more in the way of, you know, international cooperation, global governance, or else we could take a steep dive, which I got to say, given the last, not just a couple of years, but 10, 20 years, uh, seems certainly not not off the table, the steep dive scenario. But um, I also looked at, at uh, questions of teleology, of purpose, you know, is is the direction of history, can that be taken as evidence that maybe the universe was created with a, a purpose that the kind of physical unfolding of the algorithm that gave rise to the universe uh, is in some sense a purposeful one and, um, and so on. So Non-Zero is a book that I got like 80% through and then I didn't finish it, not yet anyway. So well, I now apologize. you know what now you know what you missed, and now I'm sure I know you're what not I gonna. Well, but what were your conclusions? What were your conclusions? How did you? What is your personal thinking about the teleology of the universe? Well, I think much more than most people who share my fundamentally naturalistic views and my 
kind of pretty hardcore Darwinian orientation, more than almost everyone who shares those views, I think there is some reason to suspect that uh, there could be a purpose unfolding, uh, a purpose with a kind of a moral dimension. Um, and again, I'm not talking about spooky forces guiding evolution in human history. I'm talking about the purpose being built into the algorithm that uh, that natural selection is and maybe the algorithm that more fundamentally gave birth to a universe in which natural selection eventually winds up happening. So that's, and, and I do think consciousness is, is one reason to not, not to, uh, to readily abandon the, the possibility that there is this kind of uh, purpose. Um, and uh, I guess, you know, it's funny. Um, over the last few years, uh, a respectable, I mean, the, 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 this teleology stuff has gotten me in all kinds of trouble. You know, because first of all, people hear the word and, and, and are so appalled. You know, people of the kind that I've described are so appalled that they don't even want to, they can't bring themselves to actually pursue what you're saying enough to understand what it is. It's just like a, you know, and so, um, you know, like Steve Pinker, I have told him, I think I told him on my podcast, I think he's... uh it's almost, uh, it's it's like the equivalent of a religious, what he would condemn as a religious reaction to something that's so irrational. It's like, just hear the word and freak out and start attributing all these things to people. Um, and um, and so that's, it's been a, uh, you know, because so it's like anathema, the word. Yeah. And yet, Suddenly, in all of these kind of respectable circles, scientifically respectable cir- circles, it's totally legit to speculate about whether we're living in simulation in a simulation. Well, folks, if we are living in a simulation, <laughs> I've got news. It is a purposeful, it is a purpose, by definition, if some intelligence, you know, I'm not saying we are. I'm just noting that th- there are, it's not considered quite crazy to talk about living in a simulation. That's my understanding. I mean, even people who like laugh it off are like, okay, at least it's a scientific hypothesis because this simulation thing would operate according to rules and algorithms and so so fine. It would be a scientific world. Well, that's what I was talking about. The universe being this scientific place run by physical algorithms in in a sense, Um, but it could still have a purpose. And um, I just think there's more it's an inherently conjectural question. It's not like you're going to get to the bottom of it, uh, you know, unless God rips open the veil and, you know, says, okay, uh, mystery's over. Um, the, uh, but I think there's more evidence. I, I just think there's more evidence uh, to suspect such a thing than, than uh, some people credit. Yeah, yeah. Well, and what I have taken away from your discussions of, teleology is is that it would be sort of an an like an inevitability like thinking about it as that evolution might unfold in sort of this inevitable way um and i think when a lot of people hear about teleology they do imagine sort of this caricature of a god saying it's going to unfold this way at this hour at this time. And it, and so it undermines the ability for people to really engage with this idea of inevitability. Um, Right. Well, I would say a couple of things. First of all, my, I do believe that the evolution of intelligent life was very likely on this planet, given enough time without the planet, like getting blown up. And that belief does figure in my speculations about purpose, but that's not to say the human species was ordained. Um, you know, it's like, uh, I also believe uh, automobiles, something like the automobile was bound to get invented sooner or later. Doesn't mean I thought Henry Ford would be like the big famous person, right? I mean, or, or that the United States would be the country or that the United States would exist. You know, there can be certain uh, functional things that are highly likely to evolve, even in a highly contingent framework. And that's why Stephen Jay Gould's arguments against 
uh, the likelihood of the evolution of intelligence were to a large extent just confused. He was just he was just, you know, he, he thought that uh, after he had shown that the human lineage could well have gotten wiped out, he, he seemed to think that that was the same as showing that uh, intelligent life wouldn't have been likely to evolve. And and it, it, it's not. Um, so let's see, I was going to say um, something else, but I don't. Uh, I'm not an intelligent enough form of life to remember. <laughs> I was it. just talking about how it seems like sometimes these caricatures of a god might get in the way of. Oh, 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 yeah. I know what I was going to say. It, it could be tele teleological without it being a conscious, intelligent being that created it. Because, uh, you know, the analogy would be organisms are in a meaningful sense purposive. Even Dan Dennett says, yes, organisms have a purpose imbued in them by natural selection. The purpose is to get genes in the next generation and then to do certain things that are subordinate to that, like get nutrition and so on. So, so that's a case of natural selection, a presumably unconscious process giving rise to something that in some sense has a purpose. Well, you can imagine specific scenarios that, uh, you know, cosmological natural selection scenarios where universes are giving birth to other universes uh, that where, where um, a likelihood of, cre uh, of um, where a universe where intelligent life is likely to evolve could be the eventual product of, of many, 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 many generations of uh, natural selection among universes. We needn't dwell on this any further. You know, if you want to, if you want to uh, see details, uh, you know, you can go to my um, conversation with Lee uh, Smolin, um, but uh, who's, who came up with the, the idea of cosmological and natural selection. He's a very smart physicist. Um, but the point is, even even to uh, you, to say that maybe the universe is teleological isn't the same as saying maybe it was created by a conscious being, even though that is one way tele purpose could be imbued. Right. So, I mean, you had pointed, I, I watched your Ted talk on, um, these, I, the, the ideas with not zero mm -hmm. and, um, I, you had pointed out like, okay. And, and even earlier in this conversation, this is a double-edged sword it could be win-win, it could be lose-lose. Like we, mm -hmm. we could create, you know, nuclear bombs and blow ourselves up and that's it. Um, so, and, and then in that talk, you also mentioned that you think that there's a need for moral progress in some sense. And I'm, I'm wondering, I don't, I've, I'm probably projecting this onto you, but I wanted to ask if that need for moral progress as part of what sparked your interest in meditation and in Buddhism? You know, maybe. I certainly think there's a connection. I mean, I, I what got me interested in meditation, I'm really genuinely not sure. I mean, I went to college at a time when people were kind of interested in Eastern stuff. You know, this is the late 70s. Um, so, you're, you know, and so I tried it every once in a while in the ensuing years. Um, never really clicked. Finally, for whatever reason, I was curious enough to go to a, a, a week-long silent meditation retreat. I had never had much success meditating, and that really just that week just put me into another zone. I was, I, it was amazing to me what a transformation of consciousness could be achieved by a week uh, in silence and meditating. I, I think the curiosity that got me there wasn't so much about kind of how do we save the world, but um, I, I also think I now think that, um, mindfulness meditation could be one tool that is used to increase the chances that the world gets saved. Um, because, uh, I don't know. I think it's a good way to erode, um, what, you know, you could you could call the the psychology of tribalism, by which I mean a a bunch of different cognitive biases that um, can lead to conflict between groups. Whether the conflict is the kind we see in America in the political realm today, the political polarization, or actual physical fighting uh, between nations, between religious sects, whatever, um, and so I guess. Uh, 
I, 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 I do now see a connection between those, those two things. Um, but, but not, I don't know whether, whether, whether my, my initial motivation to meditate had much to do with my, my, any kind of save the world impulse. Yeah. Do you have a sense now for like, what is, um, what is needed to, well, well, let me, let me step back a little bit here and ask the title of the book, why Buddhism is true is a somewhat provocative title. <laughs> so could you tell me about what you mean by that? Yeah, I mean, the book starts with a disclaimer, uh, you know, several things I don't mean by the book. Uh, one thing I don't mean is that I'm talking about, I'm not talking about the, the so-called religious parts of Buddhism. Uh, you know, more than a lot of Americans realize, Buddhism in Asia is a full-fledged religion. There's gods, there's a good after life, a bad afterlife, how you behave in this world will determine what you get, and so on. Um, it isn't about, it isn't a defense of any of that. Uh, it's a defense of, you might say, the psychology, a lot of the, the, the core psychological and philosophical doctrines of Buddhism. Um and also, it's, it's not an exclusivist claim. I'm not saying that no other spiritual or philosophical traditions um, are true. Uh, I, I'm just not opining on that. Uh, but, um, you know, the basic, at the most basic level, uh, I guess I'd say the fundamental claim of Buddhism is the reason we suffer and the reason we cause other people to suffer is because we don't see the world clearly in some sense. So uh, there's a kind of delusion that's almost built into us. It's certainly it's with us from birth. Um, and uh, there are various ways of describing the core delusions uh, in Buddhist terms. Um, but you know, I uh, I argue that uh, in 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 you know in the shortest form, the answer to the question why is Buddhism true is is because we are animals. I argue that um, natural selection built into us the delusions uh, that um, that Buddhism rightly points to as a big problem and seeks to dispel. Mm, interesting. And so do you continue to meditate? Do you practice meditation regularly? I do. Uh, I'm right now doing 40 minutes a morning. Uh, uh, and that's actually an improvement. I had kind of gotten a little careless and would it would range from 20 to 30, 35 minutes a day. But lately I've been on a, a reform campaign. And so what is it about seeing clearly and practicing meditation that is supposed to bring about uh, like moral progress or change? Well, um, uh, I mean, first of all, you know, meditation famously can kind of just calm you down. And generally speaking, uh, being calm can keep you from uh, committing various kinds of mistakes, including like sending an ill-advised email to somebody who really annoys you. Um, but if you want to speak a little more deeply, I would say that I think, and there's, there's actually not any data on this that I know of. I think data about meditation is hard to come by. In my book, I didn't cite a single meditation study because I, you know, there are all these studies that say meditation does this good thing, and and then there's uh, there are there's these meta analyses that say well uh, the, the benefits don't seem that great or they don't seem to exist at all. From the beginning, I didn't want to I didn't want to rest my uh, uh, you know my case on 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 those kind of studies. I think it's very hard to measure what you would hope meditation would change. Uh, I think you have some people doing the studies who have a kind of a commitment to meditation and that, you know, at an unconscious level can bias the results and so on. So I don't know about the data and I'm not even aware of experiments who that have tried to look at the things that I think would be um, interesting to look at, which would involve 
uh, the mindfulness meditation and the erosion of certain cognitive biases. So, I mean, let me give you a, an example of what I think is an underappreciated cognitive bias. I mean, a famous one is confirmation bias that, that may need no explaining, but it's just, you know, uh, being more aware of, receptive to uh, information, more likely to remember information that confirms your attitudes and your ideology than you are to notice and remember evidence at odds with your attitude or ideology. That's confirmation bias. That, that's pretty famous. There's a subtler uh, cognitive bias that I th think is underappreciated, which is um, attribution error. And this is, a re I think this is really, uh, I think these two biases, if you really eliminate them, I think you'd probably save the world, you know. I think if we could get everybody to rid themselves of these two biases, not that I walk around all day uh, free of them. I mean, the, you got it's a constant struggle, but if you could, um, I think it'd be a much better world. Attribution error, uh, originally, they thought of it as um, when you explain people's behavior, having a tendency to overemphasize um, the, the role of personal disposition, in other words, the, the kind of person the person is, and underemphasize circumstance or environmental consideration. So, standing in line uh, to check out at the pharmacy, uh, the person behind you is being rude, the person in front of you is being rude to the clerk, and you just infer that the person is a jerk, right? That's what we normally do, right? That's the judgment we normally make. This person's a jerk. Uh, more often than we probably realize the person just had a horrible day for all we know they just found out they have a terminal illness we don't know and originally attribution error was was the idea that we tend to uh overemphasize disposition and underemphasize circumstance uh, in explaining people's behavior uh but it turns out it's more complicated than that it turns out that with our friends and our allies it it it, it works like this if they do something good and laudable, we're more likely to attribute it to their disposition, the kind of people they are. If they do something bad, we're more likely to explain it away via circumstances. Oh, they've been under a lot of pressure at work. They didn't get their nap, whatever. If it's our enemies and rivals, it works in the other direction. They do something good and we say, oh, they're just, you know, trying to impress their peers, uh, blah, blah, blah. That's not the real them. You know, when our enemies and, and rivals, I mean, just imagine yourself, suppose you have a romantic rival. Like, suppose I really love this woman and there's this guy, he's my rival. Well, if he does something good, I'm not going to sit, I'm not going to go like, yeah, he's really a good guy. No, I'm, I'm not going to go like, that is an aberration. He's a bad guy. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm joking, but I'm not. This is really, uh, there is this kind of tendency. And, and I mean, moreover, it's actually documented. So, and I just think this is a this 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 is a huge problem with the world. It, it means, among other things, that once people who want uh, who are in favor of a war succeed in framing the leader of the country they want to invade as evil, well, then it's over. The, the, the person can't get out of that box because if they do something good, we'll say, well, that's not the real them, and if they do something bad, we'll say that's the real them. So once you have successfully framed someone as a bad person then it's hard to change people's minds and it's hard to get them uh, to credit, for example, any diplomatic overtures they might make, you know? No, it's a trick, it's blah, blah, blah. So there are all kinds of problems with this cognitive bias. I, I, in my own experience, I do think that when I'm being most uh, faithful to my meditation practice, I am at least somewhat less likely to fall prey to both of these uh, biases, both attribution error in its, in its two basic manifestations and confirmation bias. That, that's my belief. I could be wrong. I haven't done a study. Um, but at any rate, I do think um, getting over attribution error or, or you know, minimizing its role in human affairs would be a very good thing. Because if I could point to one just one thing that I think the world needs more of. It's just more of uh, not empathy in the sense of feeling their pain, although that can have its virtues, but cognitive empathy, the ability to just understand 
how people, uh, friends and enemies, are processing the world, how the world looks to them, why they're doing what they're doing. Just understanding that, I think, could keep us out of a lot of trouble. And I think attribution error gets in the way of understanding that. Yeah, fascinating. That's really interesting. Um, well, so in just the last couple minutes here, before you go, I would love to hear about what you're kind of working on now. I know you've got blogging heads and I know you've got the Meaning of Life TV. Those are both awesome um, discussion podcasts that you all should check out. And, but I'm also wondering if there's anything in particular that you're working on as far as writing other books or just certain things that kind of keep you up at night. Well, the, uh, the other main, the most time-consuming thing for me right now is uh, probably I'm putting out a newsletter called the Non-Zero Newsletter, and people can subscribe for free at nonzero.org. And in a way, I mean, that has evolved considerably. It actually underwent a name change, and um, uh, and it, it, it kind of in a way grew out of my Buddhism book, but it, it has a lot of politics in it and uh and it has just some human psychology in it and and i think in a way i'm kind of using it i'm I'm kind of waiting to see where it goes or where i take it to kind of point me to my next book or or, you know i have broadly in mind i have what my next book is going to be relevant to it's going to be relevant to this question of how you keep uh the world from spiraling downward as opposed to upward um, but that could range from a book about American foreign policy, which I think is, uh, <laughs> has been not very productive to say the least, um, to a book about, uh, the psychology that helps explain why, in my view, American foreign policy has gone off the rails and why so many countries' foreign policies, uh, are not productive. Um, so it could be a book about psychology it could conceivably have more of a spiritual dimension. I genuinely don't know, uh, except uh, you'll find all of these elements in in the newsletter, but, um, but the mix of them has changed a little over time, and it continues to change, and all I can say for sure is that, uh, you know, if I write a book, which I hope to, um, another book, um, it'll be relevant to that, uh, this larger question, and I'll be you know, trying to, you know, trying to uh, at, at least uh, modestly increase the odds of, of of the non-apocalyptic outcome. Yeah, it's a, it's a super important question. And a lot of people are, are it's on everyone's minds these days. Um, so I, I encourage that. I look forward to that book coming out at some point. Okay. Well, if you figure out exactly what the book should be, definitely email me. Okay. I'll let you know. (laughs) Okay. All right, Bob, thank you so much for uh, chatting with me. I've loved this conversation. It's been a blast to get to talk to one of my favorite authors. Um, So thanks again. And I, I hope that this conversation was fun for you too. Well, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. It's been a blast to hear somebody say I'm one of their favorite authors. And, uh, and so thanks for, thanks for doing it. Thanks for listening. If you have questions, comments, suggestions, or requests, contact me at www.moralsciencepodcast.com. The Moral Science Podcast is sponsored by ERA Inc., a research and design think tank that's reinventing how people interact with each other. Music throughout the program is My Crewby by Kindswider and can be found at freemusicarchive.org.